Uh, now we have a very important uh, presentation by Professor Karsten uh, Cho, uh, Professor of Medicine and Cardiology in Charit University in Berlin, Germany. The subject is uh, differential diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, it, it, it is very uh, how to diagnose uh, high heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and then followed by another lecture. Uh, Welcome, first, uh, Dr. Karsten. So, everybody, sorry that there were some technical issues. I hope you can see my slides now better. Sorry that I was too late. I still was on my rounds here. And uh, I got the task to speak how to diagnose HEP. I think that's extremely important when we want to treat something, uh, it is probably difficult to diagnose. I'm pretty sure, definition? I'm pretty sure we have seen the, the definitions of uh, the disease before, and we have to differentiate patients with heart failure and so-called preserved ejection fraction. And the major question is, of course, what's going on here? Uh, why patients with regular uh, ejection fraction still have heart failure symptoms? And probably you will remember this working program of the heart. We have learned that during our studies, which we can measure in the clinic only by using a specific conductance catheter, which is able to analyze um, diastole and systole, but also volume and stiffness directly. And I think you can see here in these pressure volume loops, loops that in a patient with half the the ventricular compliance is significantly, let's say, destroyed. And um, you see that the left ventricular and diastolic pressure can be high, but even if you would reduce that with diuretics, the left ventricular stiffness would not be changed because the stiffness curve of the ventricle is still higher. And we see that the patient has no impact on ejection fraction, but the stiffness and in most, but in not all of the patients, the natriuretic peptides are significantly increased. And the question is, how can that be estimated by diagnostic approaches in the clinic? And there came up uh, last year an HFA recommendation paper, which should help us to identify such kind of patients. And I would like to go through this, the so-called HEFPEF algorithm. This is the European way how we can analyze that kind of patients. And uh, this is an algorithm which includes an initial workup. I think that's extremely important to estimate the likelihood and the pretest assessment, whether the chance is high that the patient really has a cardiac problem, and that the symptoms come from the heart despite normal ejection friction. So we ask for typical symptoms, we clarify comorbidities, EKG is important to see ischemia or rhythm diseases. We ask for standard echocardiography just to see here the ejection friction. If possible, you can also have natriuretic peptides and or you do cardiopulmonary exercise testings. I think that is extremely important, as I already said, uh, this because the diagnosis of breathless, breathless patients can be really difficult and we want not to have um, coronary heart disease patients or primary lung disease patients in our cohort. That the symptoms between neural class one and two between have PEF and have REF is, is relatively clear. So there is not the clear symptoms uh, which can differentiate that uh, to both um, diseases of the left ventricle. And uh, when we ask for classical risk factors, of course, most of the patients will be overweighted, have a metabolic syndrome or have hypertension, but that alone is of course not enough to get. The question of ejection fraction, I think, is extremely important in that kind of the, uh, discussions. Here, European data showing that the normal ejection fraction in ECHO is about 63%. And therefore, as we have new data showing that the cardiovascular event rate in women as well as in men starts about 50 or a little bit lower than 50, we wanted to stay by the inclusion criteria, ejection fraction, um, 50% with the symptoms, which increases the likelihood that the patient may have HEFPEF. And then comes a specific score. And I think this is the hard piece of our algorithm because this is the diagnostic uh, workup. 
and which of course has to be done by a comprehensive echocardiography uh, plus nitratic peptides if these peptides had not been already elevated in the initial workup program. What means comprehensive echography? Now here we were looking for the echo um, parameter which really tells us what's going on with the patient. And there we could discuss a lot of parameters, left ventricular hypertrophy, tricuspital valve regurgitation, E3 prime from the tissue Doppler, strain analyzings, and so on and so on. If you see that here, the sensitivity and the specificity of the different potential parameters which are um, more or less directed uh, with art figure are uh, with HEFPEF are so that we have to say not one single parameter makes the diagnosis. And therefore, we came up with a score in the algorithm. And the score is prepared that we have three columns. We have parameter and echocardiography, which shows us the functional abnormalities in HEFPEF, the morphological parameters, and then we thought we should interpret the echo parameters together with a biomarker like BNP in sinus rhythm or in AFib. What does that mean? For the functional parameters, we wanted to have the tissue Doppler on board, like E prime or E to E prime, and the tricuspidal wall velocity. I think it's extremely important to understand that. And there was a lot of criticism why we should have E2E prime still on board. I mean, there are parameters around showing that the left ventricular stiffness can be due to changes of the fibrogrosis, to stiffness of the myocyte or vascular changes. And in studies where this conductance catheter had been used, fibrosis had been detected in the biopsy. So in really top characterized patients, we could see that the E2E prime had a significant, but even just a moderate effect to get the diagnosis. And so we came up to say that when E to E prime is higher than 15, then we think the likelihood that the patient has a filling problem is so high that we would give the patient for the functional analyzing of diastolic function dysfunction two points. However, how is the reality? The reality is very often E2E prime is between 8 and 15. And then we want to say, well, if the patient has not fulfilled the criteria here, which you would say major criteria, we would give only one point. So in maximal, it is possible that due to functional diastolic dysfunctions, the patient can get two, one, or even zero points. With respect to a tricuspidal velocity, we just have to say that this is a parameter which is extremely important, but if this would be positive, then the patient would not get four points, it's just for the functional box. But I would still want to say that when left ventricular stiffness, left ventricular hypertrophy occurs, of course, via the lung, uh, the tricuspidal valve velocity uh, is a surrogate parameter that the left ventricle is also affected in heart failure. That happens in our clinic only in 10% of the patients, but then I'm pretty sure the patient is an advanced status quo under that kind of addition. Tricuspidal valve velocity is also a parameter for the prognosis of the patient, so I think this could be really an end stage, and it is different compared to patients with hypertension to those with patients with HEFLA. So altogether, functional, major, uh, functional analyzings, major points by a very high E to E prime, or not end, don't forget that, by a tricuspidal valve velocity higher than 2.8. In the minor points, I said already, these are the mid ranges of the E to E prime uh, values. We also added the global longitudinal strain, uh, which is something which can be also impaired. And in doubts of the scenario of patients where the major criteria are not fulfilled, can that be important? Because we have seen that global longitudinal strain is more prominent impaired and could help to differentiate of those patients who have hypertension, but this is only a minor point. So this is how the box for functional analyzing had been coming up. At that moment, two points maximum are available. 
What about the morphological changes? There we have a similar approach, which is concentrated of left ventricular hypertrophy or the size, the size of the left atrium. And I think you see here clearly that um, the um, LA basis can be uh, here calculated, very high larvae, you get two points. In those where the larvae is a little bit smaller, you get only one point. So altogether, for the morphological changes, maximum two points are available. So if you have done that, two points maximum for the functional, two points maximum for the morphological analyzer. And last but not least, according to the different cutoffs, it is possible to add the biomarkers where you can get two points if you're here or one point if you're there. However, in 20% of patients with HFPEF, the BNP levels are low. Therefore, just the biomarkers is not working. Just E to E prime is also not working. We want to have that this comes together, that you have maximal two points here, maximal two points there, and maximal two points here. So if you have a patient who had six points, then I think the likelihood that the disease is high, higher than five, it is lower than one, or even one, I think HFPEF is very low. This had been um, proceeded also in other trials, and you see here, according to the points, you have a very high positive and negative predictive value. This score is very nice if you have done the pretest analyzings before. However, I just said the world is easy, higher than five or lower than one, but usually the world is much more complicated. What are you doing when your patient got, according to this score in their algorithm, only three to four points? Then we are in the intermediate range, and then we should do a diastolic stress test, because usually that is not what the patients have. At rest, they have no problems with breathing, but they have a dyspnea during exercising, and that is that what we see also back to the um, pressure volume loop since patients, so in healthy patients is running and exercising, blood pressure is a little bit rising, but wedge pressure stays stable. The patient with half pet blood pressure is rising, but the pressure in the lungs are also rising, they are not stable. The question is how to mimic that. And there we have two forms of stress tests. The best one is probably non-invasive stress test and exercise stress test by echocardiography. Uh, you can do that also with a RAM test. And uh, what we want to see here, that you see here, E to E prime was in the mean zone, tricuspidal valve and sufficiency not really impaired. And during just uh, two minutes um, uh, a bicycle driving in the example before, you see here that the E to E prime is riding higher than 20 and tricuspid valve velocity is also very high. So, and physical stress test or also in dopamine stress, but I really prefer the, dopamine, uh, the physical stress test can help you to see whether the patients have an up range with the E to E prime well. This is not so easy. You have seen that the, that the whole system that the patient is uh, floating around and in some patients, when tachycardia occurs, suddenly the waves come here to effusion. That is sometimes difficult to measure. And then the trick is to measure it again just during the reconvalescence phase. This is usually good enough to see whether you have an inadequate uh, rise in E2B prime. You, this has been analyzed, and you see that is really a good uh, working program, but probably in 20% of the patient, it is just not measurable. And um, then we have probably to do something different, uh, and that would be here that we say when the stress echo is positive, you can get two points. If it is not positive due to technical issues, then we have to do a hemodynamic stress test. Uh, it means usually in right heart catheter analyzing in that kind of patients. And this would be really something where you have usually, if you even, especially when you do the exercise cath test, you have nearly 100% analyzing of uh, the right diagnosis. Now, the question is, when is an inner, in, invasive evaluation of suspected HFF indicated? So, when you have technical limitations by the echo stress test, and when you have an intermediate pretest probability, and or when you really are uncertain in the diagnosis, and this would have a consequence of the treatment. So, I would not do that in an 80 years old lady under that kind of conditions. When I would not do that, um, when the pretest 
uh, probability is very low, um, or when it is very high, then usually the resting test would be already positive. So we come here, I would say, what are the first line parameters and the FFF score? Then, of course, left ventricular function higher than 50%. Increase in E2E prime, tricuspidal valve velocity, morphology, and anti pro BNP. I think if you take that in account, you should get a, have the diagnosis very soon and fast. There are other parameters which can be also analyzed, but they are not primary investigated and they have the score just to uh, take them in account. And last but not least, as soon as you don't know what's going on, if you're in the intermediate zone, please start the stress test. In summary, at rest, BNP is often normal. Don't forget that. Just to take a BNP or anti-pro BNP, and if it is low, does not mean that the patient still can have a cardiac-impacted uh, heart, including HFPEF, especially in adipositas patients. And e 3 prime at rest is very often in the gray zone. So we believe that in 30% of the patients, due to these limitations of the investigation at rest, you need a stress test, and I think it is an echo stress test, where you have a detection rate in up to 80%. Sometimes this is also false positive. And if you really need that, and you want to get the diagnosis, then you have to invasive stress test under that kind of condition. That had been investigated also for the future. And you see that the HFA HFPEF program is so good that it does not help you only to get the diagnosis, but it is also possible to get the prognosis of the patient. More points means lower lifespan. Last but not least, that is also new, they ask for the etiological uh, workup. When you have the diagnosis, not every time the patient has hypertension or diabetes, uh, they ask for MRI investigations or scintigraphy to get uh, specific cardiomyopathies, which sometimes have hefpef like syndromes. And um, with that, I would like to, to close under that kind of conditions, because the other parts I will get in another talk. This is the FPEF algorithm, pretest analyzings, the score. If the score is not inclusive completely, ask for a stress test, and last but not least, ask for the etiology workup. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> What about the left atrial diameter? Left atrial diameter as a part of the assessment of diastolic function. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Left atrial diameter, value in assessment of diastolic function. Our voice is not here. Uh, yeah. You hear us? Yes, I hear you. No. Uh, lift atrial diameter value in assessment of diastolic function. Lift atrial volume. Lift atrium. You mean left atrial function. So left atrial function in the moment is not directly included in the score. Um, the meaning here is that a lot of techniques are possible, for instance, strain on the in the left atrium, but they are really difficult to do. They are not really approved in large uh, trials in the moment. And um, therefore, the function of the left atrium is not recommended, cannot be really analyzed. And we believe that just the size of the atrium is a surrogate parameter, whether the disease has reached this kind of the chamber. There are a lot of uh, trials and investigations, especially our echocardiography experts, showing that even strain analyzings in the uh, in the atrium are possible. But I think technique is difficult; it's time-consuming, and probably not necessary in the moment to get here extra information when the left atrial size is increased, and there we have different cutoffs. Uh, I think this is, in the moment, good enough to get the diagnosis. Don't forget that when we come up with a European um, recommendation, it must be possible that very rich people in the Scandinavian countries uh, usually uh, can do that. 
but also other countries where echo machines are not already on very high level are available, um, should be also possible to get the diagnosis. So left ventricular, left atrial size is not what we are strongly recommending for. If you have an addition strain analyzing just for you, then I think it is helpful to underscore your diagnosis when you're somewhere in doubt, but in the moment we have not enough experience whether left atrial ejection fraction or left atrial uh, ejection fraction reserve, also interesting to discuss, is already measurable everywhere. everywhere. Uh, thank you. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one about the uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction can be uh, classified into with preserved longitudinal strain or with reduced longitudinal strain. Do you think that uh, it is important for diagnostic and the prognostic purpose to measure longitudinal strain in patients with HFBF? The second question about the prognostic value of BNB. Uh, you mentioned and this, uh, about the above 20% uh, of patients with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection had near normal BNB, and this is called uh, uh, BNB deficiency syndrome. The, uh, this is a phenol, one of the phenotype of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. If the, the BNB has a prognostic uh, role in, uh, in patients with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Yeah, BNP has a, has a prognostic value, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, my, what can be the reason that BNP is increased in HFP? One is that the patient has atrial fibrillation, uh, probably not um, persistent, but in some periods of his uh, day or the week, uh, he can have atrial fibrillation, and this is then determined by an increase of BNP. Especially in the beginning of HEPP, probably the left ventricular hypertrophy is compensating the wall stress. And in that moment, the patient has already HEPP, or is on the way on HFPEP and therefore BNP is still not increased, or we know that in obesity, the BNP levels are relatively low because the abdominal fat is metabolizing the uh, BNP molecules. So in those where BNP is high or higher, the prognosis is impaired. However, BNP can be also near normal for instance, in patients with adipositas, therefore BNP cannot exclude HFPEF. But if the patient has a normal ejection fraction and BNP is increased, uh, other diseases are excluded, including coronary heart disease. It shows that it belongs to the disease. So I every time would take BNP in that kind of patients, but if it would be normal, the patient is clinically still so that I say, hey, there is a chronic problem. I would remember that BNP can be normal despite HFPEF. The value of longitudinal strain assessment of uh, measuring of the longitudinal strain, the value of it. It is in some of the patient also impaired because I think the world is a little bit too easy if you would say HFPEF is just diastolic dysfunction. I had shown you in the circle that the working program of the heart are not separate working. If the diastole is impaired, systole can be also not normal. And therefore, the strain analyzing, global strain, orational strain, will be also impaired to some extent because it belongs together. But the change in strain analyzing is not so impacted and not so important for that what we see for tricuspidal valve insufficiency occurs at least in a really severe kind of patients and then the tissue doppler analyzing. Therefore, strain analyzing since HFPEF can be detected, should be taken in account. Uh, important for those patients who are somewhere in the mid zone and you are looking for more arguments. But, um, I think it is not the major uh, echo parameter to get the diagnosis. It's an add-on. Uh, thank you, Professor. I have two short questions. Uh, do you recommend that uh, every hostel or institute has a unit for heart failure, especially if have patients, uh, to rule in 
to, to judge the algorithm to have a clear uh, path or algorithm for the patient or not? This is the first question. The second one, if you have an elderly female, elderly female, uh, and uh, by virtue we cannot diagnose uh, heart failure without symptoms and or signs. Uh, if she's still in stage A or B, do you have uh, echo basis that this female or this male elderly one would be in stage C or D frank heart failure uh, after some times? Uh, I mean, uh, prognostic value for uh, these uh, or predictors? Yeah, very good question. I think this is uh, the largest uh, headache question you can give me, and uh, I start <laughs> with, your first, with your second questions first. Older female ladies, um, they have a lot of comorbidities, they are old, and therefore the E to E prime will not be normal. Therefore, the E to E prime values are gender and age dependent. If you look to the paper, you see that we try to overcome that problem that we recommend to analyze these values according to the age. And that is something what could help you. In addition, of course, all older patients female or not female, they must have a diastolic dysfunction over the centuries of their life. But the cutoffs for the age are relatively well known, and that could help you to see whether the patient has an FPEF diastolic dysfunction, an echo, or whether it is an age-related, unimportant uh, change in diastolic function. Second, I believe that BNP is here also helpful. So an older lady with a higher E to E value plus in BNP plus left ventricular arterial sizes, that is not normal. All the diastolic dysfunction detectable in echo by E to E prime uh, belongs to the disease. So therefore we have, especially for older, low, uh, older ladies, such kind of a score developed to have more parameters on one table which then allows us the likelihood of whether the disease is in front of us. About the and unit? You, and you, the unit, now it would be my dream. The Americans have that. The, we in Germany, we do not have that because we don't have a uh, special reimbursement for that. But taken in account that 50% of heart failure patients have, have PEF, a lot of them are not in the clinic. Uh, that's also important to know. I don't know how it is in your country. They only come to the clinics when they are decompensated. Um, but I strongly recommend to have a HFPEF clinic or to have at least HFPEF specialists um, who are able, for instance, to use the algorithm and the score which I just had uh, described and to, to, to have it established in the clinics. That I think it's extremely important. The comprehensive echocardiography score, I can understand that not everybody out of the clinic can do that. And therefore, I ask for something like that. Thank you, Dr. Chöpel. 